played for you Chopin's lovely waltz in A minor, Opus Posthumus. Chopin wrote 19 waltzes in his lifetime. He loved the form of the waltz. Started writing at the age of 17 his first waltz and continued all the way until two years before his death. Only eight of those 19 waltzes were published in his lifetime and the remaining 11 were published posthumously after he died. And this waltz is in that group. It's a great piece for the early intermediate student. I love teaching it. I love playing it. And it's a, a way for the new student or the intermediate student to get acquainted and deeply in touch with Chopin's elegance and expressive melodic writing. This piece is filled with the beautiful melodies and it's all around the waltz. So what is the waltz, first of all? We have to get the character of a piece before we even know how to start thinking about it. So a waltz is moving, and it has a 3-4 rhythm always, and it's heavy on the downbeat and light on the second beat, and even lighter on the third beat. So that means it's going to sound one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And that's what we want to put into our playing, always imagining that we are the dancer or dancers. So if we start with the left hand, I'm going to show you how I play this using my arms as a dancer starting in second position. My elbows are slightly bent and out from my side and they go like this and they lift up and they drop down, scoop the bass note and slide up and get the second and third beats. And that's complicated for a newer student. This jump is huge from this A all the way up to this A minor triad. That's a big jump. And how we do it is to, with arm weight, everything is with the arms and pulsing the arms. The fingers are a follow through from the arms. So everything we say, we play with our arms, especially with the waltz. Take a breath before you begin. And lift on the upbeat. Three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I am purposely playing that last chord, the third chord, a little lighter than its predecessor. So just taking the chords, in measure one we have an A minor triad, measure two we have a D second inversion, D minor, that's that chord. And then measure three, that's really a G, five seven chord with the D left off. The fourth measure resolves to a C major second inversion. So in the space of four measures, he went from the home key tonic of A minor, measure four, he took us to the relative major, C major. But he doesn't stay there because measure five, six, seven, and eight does a repetition. And this is key to understanding how this entire piece is built. Now let's take a look at measures five, six, seven, and eight. Instead of starting on this A down here, Chopin uses the next octave up for measure five. That's the first difference in the left hand. Measure five, measure six, identical. Now measure seven, listen to this, it changes and a sixth instead of a three note chord. So three differences already. This A instead of the lowest, the sixth at the end instead of the three note chord, and the critical measure seven. 
the last two measures are absolutely defining in this piece because they have three different endings. The first ending measure seven doesn't do this. It doesn't do this. It does a combination of the two and you want to bring that out. This. Rest. That rest is very important. Then if we go on to the next eight measures, and the good news is, measures 9, 10, 11, 12, the begin or second system, are identical to measures 1, 2, 3, 4. So we already can start to learn this. This lesson, I am very much hoping to communicate to you how important it is when you first start learning a piece to analyze what's in there, what is the expression of it, and how quickly can I memorize it. We're going to memorize in little four measure units and little two measure units. And those will stick. That's how you will practice this. Measure nine. Notice, I could talk for a half hour just on the first four measures of the left hand. We don't have that time. But the principle is heavy on the bass note with more weight. That's the downbeat. The dancers are standing with their full body weight on that note. Heavy, light, and lighter. I like to stroke the key off on the end. And pedal, hold, off, at least on the third beat. Pedal, sometimes I release the pedal on the second beat. And do you know what determines that? What goes over it? If it's intervals that match the chord, I don't have to change the pedal. But if it goes up stepwise, which is going to make a blur, then I need to change my pedal. Let's take a look at the right hand melody now. This is the heart and soul of the piece, of course. The melody tells the story. So in the key of A minor, first five notes, he starts on the fifth note of the scale, the E, the dominant, and reaches up a fourth, to the tonic. Three, one. So the two hands, beginning with the piece, three, one. And I feel that distance here. Now the right hand goes on with two little motives. Three note motives going up stepwise. And Connected by a single C, which I like to play very lightly and go off. Well, our ear hears A, B, C, and D, E, F. That's C, third beat of measure one, needs to be in the background. Otherwise, it's going to interrupt the delicacy of these three note slurs. Notice that I'm going a little brush movement again with my arm. I'm dropping down and up and brush the two like that. Or brush the thumb. Whichever finger you choose. Measure three now is going to drop down this diminished fifth down to the B. So tell yourself, measure three, my thumb goes down to B and makes this beautiful, arcing reach of a seventh. And rests on the E with a little turn. And this beautiful D sharp. And that's how he ends. Right there, that D sharp, that is not in any of the A minor scales that we have. A minor natural is all the white keys. Harmonic minor 
minor raises the seventh step. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven with the G sharp. And lastly, melodic minor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And natural on the way down. So this D sharp is an added note that he has chosen as a special spice to give a clue to the character of the inwardness and a little twinge of sadness. It's a little bitter, and it's, but it's inward. It's not, it's not angry, it's not resentful, but it's definitely pensive. I like to think of this, I often ask, ask my students in fact, it's a really good assignment for you as teachers. When we think about the character of the piece, ask your students to come up with three words that they think describe this piece. Three words of how it makes them feel, or what they think it's about. Yeah, but, uh, what does it activate inside of us? Because that's what we're putting into our music. So when we get that turn, measures three to four, we know we're going to come to that D-sharp. We know ahead of time that we want to give a special thoughtfulness to how we play that, the tone we get, the care we give to it. And this big open fifth, that one counts too. It comes down. This is a little heart murmur. That's how I hear it. It's meaning, there's meaning in every ornament. Then measures five, six, seven, and eight begin the same with the three notes A, B, C, light, D, E, F. Measure seven now drops down to the B, just like measure three did, and reaches up to the A, and there's the difference. Now the next note goes back down to be with that sixth, down a sixth, and up a half step to the C. And now I'm going to show you what I'm looking at. I love showing this. This is a brand new engraving of my addition that I made of this piece. Showing the entire piece the notes that you'll see in any other edition taken from public domain music, but not looking at all like this, because I'm able to get on long eight measure uninterrupted phrases the entire statement as it is in one line. We've already looked at this part now. Notice that I've got colors on all of this. And you say, well, what are those? Well, those are showing the different sections of this piece. This is an extraordinary piece, the way it's constructed. Now, when you first learn your music, you will get in your chart package, which, by the way, you can get from my website, sallychristianmusic.com, as digital downloads. You will find in your chart package the working copy on two pages. This is page one. Lots of open, clear space here to make your notes. And, uh, and then you also get in your chart package the entire piece on one vertical board. The 11 inch by 17 going this direction instead of this direction. And this is really remarkable. And then what I did, after I make the chart, because I have to re-engrave the entire piece so that it's copywritten, I'm not violating any copyright laws, this is my edition, and then I can put the notes on a new format like this, and finally, the finished product is this beautiful color structural analysis. As you can see, I love this part. This is, this is the entire roadmap of the piece. And what you see here are the colored boxes. 
blue, blue, green, blue, yellow, blue, a little blue, and pink. And that's the form of the piece. What do you notice? The blue comes over and over and over again. In fact, the first four measures of that blue, now I'm going to take a long reach with my arm and get this handy blue protractor because it shows up on the music. I've gotten comments when I use this in other videos. Why are you using a protractor? What has that got to do with music? It doesn't have anything to do with the music, but it's a color contrast to white paper. And it's just the width I want to be able to drag this down the page and highlight more clearly what I'm wanting to communicate, which is measures 1, 2, 3, 4, measures 9, 10, 11, 12 are absolutely identical. This is section A, section A. Section A, first four measures identical. Section A, first four measures identical. So once you've learned this one, which is four measures long, you automatically have this and that, this one and this one. Now, on the right hand side here, you see these number eights. This is very important. And this is how I engraved the piece. I could have put the placement of measures any way I wanted, but the piece tells me that this is the structure. Eight measure phrases for the entire piece. I call a piece like this, lots of Bach is like this, on the grid. It's absolutely predictable. Every eight measures, you're going to have a cadence. All the cadences, endings are on the right with final measures, and all the beginnings are on the left. Now, within the eight measures, there's a midpoint, and this is essential to learning and memorizing the piece. The midway is where all the changes begin, and we need to track that and know it in advance. So the right hand then in measure 5 starts with the thumb on A, and then in the measure 13, it starts on the C. Back on this one, it's the C. This whole thing repeats, so another C, and going straight down finally back on the A, and you need to track that in advance. You tell yourself, okay, now I put the thumb on A. Now I do this cadence, this first cadence. So we start practicing right here, measure five, A on the, with the thumb, B to C. This one, we start with the thumb on C. G to E. We haven't even done this yet. And the third one, I'm giving a quick overview of where we're going in this lesson so you can see how important these differences are. The material is mostly the same on this half divided this way, and this half is where all the changes happen, and knowing that in advance already has made this much easier to track. Our third and final cadence here starts again on the C. This is all the blue box material, section A, and then goes to a D sharp. Unexpected, that's that D sharp again he used in measure uh, four, isn't it? But used in a different way here now. It's lovely. And then the fourth and final, the good news is that this sixth system is absolutely identical to the first system. So once you learn this, you have got this learned. All right, now let's go back to our music and take a look at the second system.
and my music, I'm going to be right here. And you could go ahead and transfer these colors. These are in colored pencil. If you like looking at this and it helps you to track it better with the big notes that you're going to learn your music from, it's not that hard to do uh, just with the ruler and just copy what I already did on this color structural analysis so it's bigger if that helps you. Okay, let's start now at measure 9 with the repetition of the section A. There are four section A's in the piece. myself now right hand down a third second ending up to D beautiful do you hear how open that is it just opens you this fifth and down again a half step and then the section B, I have to go on because it's absolutely gorgeous. Hands together the previous cadence here. Measure 15. Both these start on the dominant and new material comes. The right hand starts with the idea of uninterrupted melodic scale notes using what does this sound like what do you think this is it is it's a melodic minor and that's how he starts the b section on the dominant of a minor using the a melodic minor scale and he goes up six notes and falls again. Now this is extremely meaningful. You're wanting to break out and you can't quite make it. Fall. It's asking a question. There's a fifth. And then he has a little one. Oh, so sad. That half step, E, F, E, and a third one falling yet again. Whole step that time. A, B, A. Half step, which is a minor second, and whole step, which is a major second. Feel the differences. Hear the differences. We're learning now, we're memorizing. So we start on the dominant E and we go up, one, two, three, turn, down, drop down with your thumb on the dominant E, up a fifth to the B and rest on the A. Repeat that little trill now on the new note A, down to the dominant E with your half step, up and back down to the E. And one more turn on the dominant to outline the A minor triad. So with a few repetitions on that, that is four measures long. You can do the first four as you go to learn this. Or break it down into two and two. The piece breaks down beautifully for the entire piece as two measures, two measures, two measures, two measures. So let's do it that way. Let's take the first two measures, 17 and 18. Let's do it again. Until you feel comfortable. Now go on to the next little and little. This I want to show you in my music here. This helped me tremendously thinking, watching the length of the beams. For instance, in our opening, we have two littles, one and two, three, one and two, three, and now a long six notes beamed together, uninterrupted. 
Well, in your green box, section B, he's re inversed the placement of those. He's taken the long unit, the long beams and uninterrupted, and made the longest phrase of all so far. He has phrased these two measures together. That means something. This is starting to open up. This is starting to elongate, but it doesn't quite make it. And it drops down to a little one and a little one. Not as little as these, but still you can see. And that gives you an idea how to breathe this. And then here's our midway point. So first four measures, and then comes the next four of the B section, and that's the only B section in the piece, Chopin does something marvelous here. Now, it would just happen to be that it's the most difficult thing too in the piece. This is the part where students tell me, I don't know how to do this, this is too hard, I can't do this, and it is hard. It's a variation of these notes. <laughs> He takes it starting on this E and goes all the way up to this B. Imagine, how is he going to get that far in the space of one measure? Well, he's going to make an arpeggio, an E major arpeggio. Now that is your E major triad broken and repeated one more time up the octave and a third time. Now if I played them all evenly, we have this technique of legato, which is critical to beautiful Chopin, Chopin playing. I can't let go of this B, I have to drop. That's hard to do. Please don't jump off that B. That sounds awful. Uninterrupted and continuous, but the plot thickens. Chopin divides the rhythm into a written out accelerando. He puts a triplet on the first beat, a quintuplet on the second beat, and a quadruple on the third. Triple R, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, one, and two, and three. And clapping is essential. Triple R, one, two, three, four, five, one, da, 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 da. Beautiful, ingenious. Let's see what that sounds like. Breath, always breath. And I raise my arms before I play, always. Coming from the previous phrase. Lift, breathe. One, two, three. And then up an octave, reaching to the highest E on the piano and down to the A. How tender, how exquisite, how gentle, how imaginative. It's just a moment of rhapsody. It's just. Uh, it's really extraordinary. It's, this piece may seem to be a neglected piece. I mean, he felt so, he didn't publish it, but it isn't. That's the thing about Chopin, he didn't write anything bad. They're all great. They're just some of our more great. Now, I have not begun to talk about one of the most important defining elements in the music of Chopin and his writing is four-part harmony. Chopin loved the music of Bach. He revered Bach more than any other composer and modeled his composing after Bach. And so we don't have a melody and an accompaniment, which goes on forever. That's not how Chopin writes his left hands melody, which is, uh, it's, you could call it an accompaniment, but I hear it as a separate heart, beautiful on its own. And the reason is, on those chords we had at the beginning, we're going back to measure one now because this is the last element and it's critical 
for shaping and hearing all of the hidden treasures that Chopin has written intentionally into the left hand part. And so many pianists play this and they bypass it. They play them all the same. Like it's a block of homogenized sound. It isn't. It's four separate voices. So the bass note as we started on the A, up a fourth to D, up a fourth to G, up a fourth to C. That is the signature template of 25% of the piece because measures one through four happen five times, including a repeat. So this is very important in this piece. diverging just a bit here to show how to practice the left hand and we will continue that into the green box. I can't do the green box yet until I've shown you this part. Now we have the other three notes above it, the A minor triad, the D minor, the G7, and the C6-4. Now I'm going to show you this way as bass, tenor, alto, soprano. Bass, tenor, four part harmony. Alto. Alto. And we are going to practice first taking the left hand alone, going from the bass to the soprano. You can do it with two hands first, like this, to acquaint yourself. Ultimately, you have to do it all with the left hand. That's fingers five, one, one, five, one, one. Notice my technique. I'm standing on the thumb for the last one. Let's do that again. I'm down, I'm coming down, opening the hand, eyeballing the E, touching it with the tip of the thumb, and off. Arm down, scoop up the D, eyeball the F. Scoop down to the G, eyeball the F. Scoop down to the C, eyeball the E. That's easy, because that's you can practically reach that. It's a tenth. But the others you can't. Now let's do that going bass note. with the two hands redistributed, knowing your fingering, you're going to go with the note, this is bass to alto. C, C with the third finger, D, D, the second, B, B with the fourth finger, and two on that C. So you really need to know those fingerings of those chords. And there's there are a few options there with fingerings. Use the ones that are best for your hand. That will vary from student to student. But once you decide on the fingering that fits your hand the best, never deviate from it. Once you choose a fingering, stick with it. Don't change fingerings because that's a sure formula for having an accident in performance. In fact, that's why it's so hard when you go to change fingerings. I've had pieces where a fingering has failed me over and over again. I can never get it clean. And I go back and I look and I go, oh, you know, that's not the greatest fingering. And I change it then. And then it takes me twice as long. I have to unlearn it and then learn it all over again, twice the time. So save yourself a lot of trouble and learn it correctly from the very beginning. And doing this will reinforce not only the note itself, but the fingering. Now let's do the same thing with the remaining bass to the tenor. First is the redistribution, because this is not easy to do. But you hear what's in it as a dialogue. Did you like that one as well? Or did you like the alto? I personally like this one. 
What if we put the, ba the tenor and the alto together? Third. Fourth. Third. Did you hear the pattern? That was pretty cool. Third. Fourth. Third. Fourth. Lovely. Hidden pattern. Take the top two. Alto and soprano. Oh, this is beautiful. Now the piece comes alive. Fifth and third. See what I mean? All of a sudden now, this is a beautiful part. And you get to play it 20 times. Just that. Now let's go on to the green box and listen to what he does here. I'm going to do first the bass note alone. And you tell me. We know both hands start on the E. This is measure 17. I'm going to play the, all eight measures and listen for the pattern. See if you can identify it right now with just the downbeats of the left hand played with the five, the fifth finger. Well, it goes on. And one more time. Notice how I'm brushing the key. This is all part of showing you technique while we're learning the patterns. You incorporate the technique, you incorporate the expression, and you incorporate the notes all at once, and hopefully a little memory to go with it. And each time you practice, you work on those four elements together, and you'll have the piece learned perfectly in lightning speed time. It's really amazing how it works if you practice intelligently. And these are the steps. Okay, so it is clearly an alternating E, A, E, A, rocking out with the fourth. He uses a lot of fourth in this piece, our opening. Hey, did you know that? I just discovered that right now. That's, that's the same two notes the piece starts with. And he's doing it in those bass notes. That's the similarity of this piece. There's a lot of like material, a lot of cross-references in here. Okay, so I call this an ostinato. Now what goes over it on beats two and three? Beautiful part. I'm going to play it as written first with the hand, left hand. As written, measure 17. And I'm going to bring out what I think is the most beautiful buried part. And listen for the hidden inner horizontal melody that I'm going to try to bring out louder than the other two notes on either side. Here it is. that are communicating with each other, with their hidden clues, their eye contact, the movement of their shoulders, and how they're positioned and circle around each other. That's what the music's doing here. The vo voices are communicating a hidden, hidden dialogue. <laughs> Too, the soprano and the alto. I did this a lot in practicing. I just think it's so beautiful and it's so fun to play. E, chord, e, third, diminished fifth, thirds. Now let's add everybody. Free, be free. Off, one, two, three. with the variation. 
position. Rest. What comes next? The A section. We go to our page two. That's one of the things I love about this edition. And I forgot to tell you, when you order your chart, because you, you will take the PDF of all the files, uh, excuse me, you will take a, make a CD of it that has all the files in, that are included in this chart package and take it to your print shop and have it printed on cardstock, 60 pound heavyweight cardstock on this 11 inch by 17 inch. And your copies will come out beautiful, they'll have body, they'll stand up on the music rack, they won't bend. You'll have them forever. You can print them at home on a travel size 8.5 by 11 on regular paper for reference, which is also very nice to do. And with this piece, the notes are so big, you can even do that uh, as a working copy. The color structural analysis is going to be pretty tiny because there's a lot of information on that. So now we're starting our page two, and we go back to section A again. And you'll hear the third ending. And I call these endings musical switches because, I'll tell you after I get there. Now I have to go to the C this time. In the right hand. Now both hands do something radically different. beyond cool. <laughs> you can tell I just live for this. Music is my life. Music has always been my life. I knew as an eight-year-old that this is what I was going to do. And you know what? I talked about this in one other video on the Paladin G minor number 22, that when I was eight years old, my mother highly requested, in other words, made me <laughs> watch a movie called A Song to Remember. It was The Life of Chopin. And I really didn't want to watch it, it a grainy black and white movie, but I did. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was in tears two-thirds of the way through the movie when Chopin played the B-flat minor scherzo number two, and he had tuberculosis and coughed, and they showed the blood on the keys, a very dramatic movie. All well, the music had a stranglehold on me from then on. And I, it was, the path was closed to anything else. It was, that was the avenue with Chopin. And here it is all these years later and still madly in love with Chopin. That's how it is with this. It's your friend for life. Okay, so what I was gonna show you was, these are loose leaf and that's an advantage. And I'm gonna cover up the green box section B and I'm gonna lay my chart the two pages of my working copy like this. And then you get to start to see the absolute regularity of material. You get to see same, this is all blue box, right? So this first four measures, first four, first four, identical. Midway, A right hand, cadence one. C right hand, cadence two. C right hand, cadence three. And that's exceptionally important to remember. What if you took the wrong one? What if you took this one 
just by habit, because the thing rotates so many times with section A, what if you forget and you're playing, you go, oh my God, I took the wrong turn. What am I going to do now? That actually happened to me once in concert. And that's one of the reasons I came up with this system of showing how to better lay out the music so I could learn it better. If you take the wrong turn, know where you are and just keep going with it. Say, okay, now I'm in the yellow box, no big deal, and I'll take my repeat back here. Or maybe I'll, I'll jump back to one other place, but I know how to start the beginning phrases of all seven systems because I've practiced it that way. So when you get your chart, I highly recommend that you work from this. There are so many tools that are already prepared for you with what I've done here. Put them side by side like this. Work on box number one, blue, uh, orange box cadence number one, found in measure seven. <laughs> Cadence number two, measure 15. And a try it, three note chord. That's important. The first one had a sixth, the second one had two chords, and then the third box, totally different. That's going to be really helpful and go back and forth. And then you've practiced them out of context and you know where you are. Are you ready for the yellow box? This is section C. We go, indeed, to A major. That's exactly where he's taking us, the parallel A major. And I chose yellow for this eight measures because it's so joyful like the sun. It's so uplifting. This melody in the right hand now just gets carried away. I'll show you before I play it that you can see it's it's very much similar if I take now this green box idea of the long two measure phrase and a, and a little and a little. This is the long two measure phrase and a little and a little. So he's copying the phrase structure for the two contrasting sections B and C. That's interesting. There's another thing too that's the same, but I'm going to first take the right hand melody and show you. We start this far apart. That's so far. This is far. The cadence, which is marked modulation. That means changing to a new key. Have you heard that motive before? Run a walk, walk, run a long note. You sure have. Run a walk, walk, run a long note. So he's using the motive, the rhythm, or the rhythmic motive for this cadence. Off, left hand. And now, I'm just going to play the bass note with the right hand melody. Repetition. What did you notice? Well, this section pretty much had identical material. Starting on the B, going to way up to the F sharp. You're up here now. And a little turn on the C sharp. And a series of skips. Yeah. That's the dominant E again. So those chords are really and this. Pretty simple, isn't it? And again, repetition. Same. These dancers now. I love how he weaves around above and below the note he's going to. He's going, he's, the first four notes go to the dominant. E, E, repetition. A. 
on the bass. The same thing of the rocking fourths. Now, there's, now I'll just play the left hand part for you here in section C. And we're going to compare the left hand in section C and section B as a way to learn the piece. This lesson is a lot about how to practice. You do these steps, you will learn the piece, I guarantee it. Okay, here's measure 33. This is the last contrasting material we will hear until we get to the end with the coda. So we're a lot through the piece already. Now I'm gonna hear this uh, inner voice again. The alto. pressure. A lot of piano playing is finger pressure from the tips. You really, that's the only, I call these the grippers. And, and I, I like clay. I need the keys. K-N-E-E-D. I also N-E-E-D them. I need them. And I also need them. So I'm going to put a little more stroking on this alto. to do it because it's hard and it's also can be so overdone quickly but it's called the idea of the waltz and the lift and the lift is a slight elongation on the second beat one two three one two three you can really hear it at this king's now I'm gonna just pause a little bit on that second two, three, one, two, a little uh, interest and and it actually replicates what the waltzers are doing if you've ever watch, watched a waltz so hands together here now breath second position elbows out and away you go straight torso keep your torso straight you're gonna keep your body we sit forever on these benches and there's no back support how do we do it abdominal support extremely important and you're going back and forth and everything is anchoring by your abdomen breathe arms up <laughs> went back to here and did it all over again so therefore instead of seven systems we have ten one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and that's your piece now, I've never heard that explained before like that, and I've certainly never seen it like that. But it helps me to know, my, uh, where am I going? How, you know, the kids in the car, you go, hey, mom, when are we going to get there? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And that's kind of like it in this piece when you're playing it. Are we going to get there? How many repeats do we have? Did I do that repeat already? It's hard to track a piece like that that has so much repetition and when it has repeats stuck in. So I came up with a really nifty key code for you. And it's on your color structural analysis at the top. I did those 10 systems as a little pattern to show the compositional form of this piece. AA, those are in the blues. BB in the green, AC, AC, see a blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue coda. And that's 
that's where we are now. Coming on the last blue box. And now when we get here, oh, by the way, I did want to say that this A major section reminds me very much of a Lindler. Yeah. <laughs> faster and so that's going to change the lightness of it. I'll have a little less pedal. You can play this at a number of tempi. You can go slower. But your staccatos then are going to be longer in the left tenor. It sounds silly. That's valid. I like it a little faster. It's got the same rests. Please watch the rests in this piece. Rest in the right hand on beat two, rest on the left hand in beat three. Same with this one and th that one. This, they both rest on the very end. Those rests are important. You actually remove your hands from the keys when there's a rest. It lifts it, it says that phrase is over. And how you lift it and when you lift is communicating part of the storyline. They say that the silences are almost even more important than the notes themselves. So carefully learn those rests. Now we're back. You could call this a recapitulation. I did put the label on your color social analysis that this measure 41, the final blue box in its full eight measure length recapitulation because it is the return of the theme but we've had the return of the theme already um, two other times so it's it's not exactly I think uh, you know if I were to say uh, this is more like rondo form maybe A C A D A, than it is sonata form with uh, the exposition of the development section and the uh, recapitulation and a coda. And this is more like rondo form. So here we are now. We're coming back, and there's no warning. We come out of the Lendler. Chopin, you know, he, he lived in Poland until he was um, 18. And then he moved to Vienna for three years, and then he moved to Paris and spent the rest of his life there. He saw, he went to the countryside and saw the Polish folk dancers. This is from his real childhood memories, this section. This is authentic. This came from deeply embedded in his psyche and his memories and his love. And when you leave that, that's a sad thing. And he's leaving it now. <laughs> rest that's what he's doing he's like what's happening oh no minor see how tender do I have to be here again Measures one, two, three, four, bass notes A, D, G, C is the circle of fourths. If you take the circle of fifths, that's starting a middle C, going up a fifth to G, up a fifth to D, up a fifth to A, and you go in reverse order on the circle, it's going counterclockwise, and those are the pitches he chose to build the left hand bass line from, from the circle of fourths. That's interesting. Here's our coda now. Measure 49. Now, without any warning, 
played that way slower than it's gonna go. The reason I did is I wanted you to feel the blend of these gorgeous harmonies. The left hand here, uh, just take the whole bass line. There's a lot in this last part here that I wanna be sure to get in the lesson starting here. I call this the coda because psychologically you're thinking already I'm ending. The different material really begins here so you have two measures of our familiar Section A material, identical. So you really have 22 measures total of, of that opening measure, one, two, three, four material. And then I started the pink box for the coda right here, a measure 51. On it, on it expected E. So we, we, by now you know this bass line, right? to do that. You sit down and practice. Can I do the bass line for memory measures one through eight? And you do that and do that for every system. It's see because anytime you jump on the piano and you go this this is really a key thing for especially advanced literature, but for any literature, you're jumping. What if you jump to the wrong note? I've had places I, I had the biggest crash of my lifetime. It was so painful, I didn't know if I even wanted to play the piano again. It was that painful. I was playing this hugely complicated piece called La Vapies by Albanus, and I derailed. I, my hands were all over the place. This piece is just crazy hard. And I landed on the wrong spot, and I didn't know how to get out. This was before I invented charts. And I was just mortified. I really was. I, it was like the hardest thing to come back from. And I wrestled for a half a year. What am I going to do? I cannot ever go through this again, ever. And that's why I invented the charts. Because now, that doesn't happen now because I know the material so much better. And I know every phrase, how it begins and how it ends. And I have my fingerings for those start points. And if something goes wrong, I'd either jump back to that beginning or I jump to the next one and I can do it like that because I practiced it like that. So, uh, so it happened because I was off the keys. You're in the air and you land in the wrong spot and it's the wrong notes and you know it's the wrong note and you don't know what to do. You panic. Or maybe you don't. Some people are really quick at recovering. But you've got to name those notes. So here you are, A. D. Practice this in your yeah, practicing at home. E. A. C. This is coda. Ah, oh, that's the first open octave we've had. And D. That's the most beautiful. I was up at three in the morning last night working on this measure. I put so much thought and time and energy into these lessons and the charts and uh, I mean it really becomes, each one is like a thesis for me. I go so deep with it and I want to understand every single note in the piece. Why does this activate us like this? It's a third scale degree, fourth scale degree. Guess what? The 
one and only minor sixth in the piece. Why does that even matter? It does matter because it defines the close. This is clearly the minor and it's open. He could have done this, but by opening the chord, This falling. Here are all the notes that clash there. It's very dissonant. That's actually, if you put a D down, For those learning the piece, I have suggested it's above here. That's a way to practice that piece. So when you think you know the piece, I think you've got it pretty much memorized. I highly recommend that you put your black and white satellite view on the music rack and play through as a reference. You can just glance up there and see, you know, how close am I to having the memory and where were my where were my weak spots? And then take this one, the color structural analysis, and really study it. Look at all those details. Go on the right hand column and see the major sixth, the triad, second inversion, this, this, this second inversion triad, this dominant chord, this major sixth, this major sixth, that minor sixth. And when you play it, track those. This is really, yeah. Uh... Oh, and the last thing I wanted to say. My husband and I are having a really great time in this stage in our lives. We're the elders in the family now. We are grandparents. We have three lovely grandchildren that we see every week. And we have a lot of fun. We hike, we walk. You've got to stay fit. You've got to exercise. We eat well. We have good thoughts. We put positive thoughts in our mind. And we both play the piano. My husband is a bass player. He plays rock and roll and blues and, and jazz and ballads, and he's pretty good. But he's always wanted to play the piano, and he's learning now. And he is doing so well, and um, he's working on the F major invention of Bach. And, excuse me, that one too, but the C major, not that it even matters, but he comes back from a practice session on the electronic keyboard, because I'm always on these, right? Sometimes I let him on the grounds, but uh, uh, anyway. And he says, I just had so much fun. I just had a blast. I could play my left hand all through the piece by itself from memory. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, that's pretty impressive. 
I couldn't do that when I first started piano. I couldn't do it at all. But he's working from the chart and he goes, it's so easy. It's all laid out for me. I just go by those systems and, and do it. And he also said that um, he's a retired physician. And so he's used to juggling a lot of difficult things and having a lot of challenging physical and mental tasks all going on at the same time. But he's retired now. And he needs to keep his brain active and going and flexible and strong so those pathways of cognitive recognition are still strong and fully working. And this is helping. Uh, Jess helps. Bridge helps. Crossword puzzles help. Learning a language helps. Memorizing vocabulary helps. And piano helps. So when you go to learn this piece, the challenge of memorizing is twofold. You are, then can play anywhere at any time. You don't need your music. You can play securely and beautifully with great abandon, not having to be stuck with your eyes up there when you could just let it flow, play with your eyes closed. But your brain's getting stronger. So whatever age you are learning the piano, this is strengthening your brain power. So that alone is worth doing. Oh, and also wards off arthritis and, you know, keeps everything working. My hands are still working great. And, uh, you know, I'm so grateful for it. I'm so grateful that we have this beautiful gift of music that we can have for ourselves, at, uh, for comfort, for, for self-expression, for joy, for sharing, for growth, all of it. It's just a wonderful, wonderful thing. So I hope... Um, this lesson has been helpful for you, and I encourage you to practice every day uh, and, and have this, these beautiful melodies going on in your mind and your heart and your spirit, your constant companion that lives inside of you, never will leave you. Thank you so much.